Great, so this is the second part of the ECG review, and we're going to start looking at ventricular and heart block rhythms, which I think are the most difficult ones to kind of understand. Um, so remember with our ventricular rhythms, it's my heart again, <laughs> um, we have a, a rhythm originating somewhere in the ventricles, and usually this happens from the Purkinje fibers uh, that branch off those bundle branches. Now with a ventricular rhythm, you're going to get a very wide, bizarre-looking QRS complex. Um, so if we just look at this wide QRS complex here, we're just going to note a few things. One, we can have a P wave that happens in the middle or right after that QRS complex. Um, it's not something that we note in our title, but just be aware it is something that you could see and that, you know, eventually we are going to get contraction of the atria because the signal is just going to be traveling backwards or the atria could be contracting by itself. Um, we could also, a lot of people will label these as ST depression, or we could have a look at some later where it looks like ST elevation. Um, that is not the case. We actually cannot see good ST segment changes when we have a ventricular rhythm. All that is is that backwards deflection of the um, conduction running from the ventricles to the top of the heart. And depending on where that's originating from or what side of the ventricles, it could show what looks like depression or elevation, but really it's just the shape of the QRS complex. Okay, so that is not depression or elevation, so we do not need to put that in our name either. All right, so looking at this rhythm here, I'm going to circle our normal complexes. So we can see here we have normal complexes. Um, we have P wave, narrow QRS, T wave, everything looking normal for this rhythm. Um, so that's going to be sinus. Now our heart rate is 61, so I don't need to count that out. I do always include the um, ventricular complexes in my rate because we don't know if they're actually conducting a beat unless we're actually feeling from mechanical pulse. So for testing purposes and when we're in class and we're reading these rhythms, we're going to assume that they are conducting a beat. And typically these PVCs will conduct a beat unless we have a lot of them or it's a very fast rhythm. So we're going to count this in our, which is why we got 60. This is about a six second strips. So we get about 60 beats per minute. So we will count that in our rate. So my underlying rhythm is sinus. So sinus rhythm. It's not normal sinus. It's not completely normal because I do have something else going on there. I don't have any ST problems. My J points right here on the S electric line. So I don't need to put any ST segment changes. I just want to note that I have PVCs, and when we're looking at PVCs, we're looking for a th couple things. One, if I have multiple PVCs, do they look the same? So are they unifocal or multifocal? Um, if they were multifocal, they would look different. These look very much the same, which means they're coming probably from the same irritated spot in the ventricle. That's better than multifocal, because if I have multifocal PVCs, I need to worry about multiple spots in the ventricles being irritated. So I have unifocal PVCs, and then I want to look at, is it in a pattern? So this one does happen to be in a pattern. I have one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's happening every third beat, which means it's trigeminal. So I have sinus rhythm, with trigeminal, unifocal PVCs. Now, if you have some kind of pattern, if it's trigeminal or bigeminal, which would be every other beat, a lot of times we don't have to put this unifocal in the name. I'm not going to count you wrong if you don't put unifocal in there because we assume that if it's happening in a pattern, they're probably coming from the same spot in the ventricle. So if you have trigeminal or bigeminal PVCs and you don't put unifocal in there, that's okay. All right, looking at this next rhythm, my underlying rhythm is just really hard to see because this printout, but we're just going to call it sinus rhythm. There is a P wave, it's very small, but we do have P waves for our QRS complexes. It's just that the printout's so tiny, it's very difficult to see. Um, and our rate is probably about 5, 10, 15, 20, probably about 75 beats per minute, if I had to guess. So my underlying rhythm here, sinus rhythm, is 75 beats per minute. What I'm most concerned about is this right here. 
This is a run of VTAC, and well, it kind of gives us the answer right there, VTAC, but remember sometimes our monitors can be wrong. But a run of VTAC is when we have three or more ventricular complexes in a row. So if it were just two, I would call that a couplet of PVCs, a pair of PVCs. But since I have three or more, and here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 complexes in a row, we would just call that a run of ventricular tachycardia. Now I know it's VTAC because my QRSs are very wide and it is very hard to pick out your QRS complexes in a ventricular rhythm. Looks like I have a complex here and I'm looking at these notches in the rhythm here. So that's how you're going to find your QRS complexes. However, you should be able to look at this and see that it is wide. It's not a narrow like an SVT. So you shouldn't have to measure out those QRS complexes. We can kind of look at that wide, bizarre um, behavior that these have and we can see that it is going to be ventricular in nature. VTAC can look different. So this one is, you know, more of a typical VTAC that we would see. Depending on where it's coming from in the ventricles, it can have a different appearance to it. Sometimes it'll even look like this. But we can see that all of these have a very wide, bizarre looking complex. So uh, it's a sinus rhythm at 75 beats per minute with a run of VT for ventricular tachycardia. All right, next one. Uh, my underlying rhythm here, so obviously I can see we do have some very different weird wide looking complexes here. So those, because they're so wide and bizarre looking, I know that they're ventricular in nature, so they're PVCs. And for some reason, the reason that PVCs happen is for some reason the ventricles are irritated and they're just kind of firing off when they shouldn't be firing off. They're kind of conducting their own beat. Um, it could be something as simple as caffeine use or fatigue or stress. Could be something more serious like stimulant use, um, illicit drug use, heart disease, uh, could be caused by a heart attack, heart failure. So there's a wide range of, of reasons for PVCs. My underlying rhythm, I have a P wave, a narrow QRS, a normal T wave. Uh, my J point is maybe a little low, so maybe some ST segment depression there. So this is a sinus rhythm. Uh, let's find out if it's tachycardic or not. So I have 5, 10, 12. So it is going to be tachycardic. So if I do 1500 divided by 12, I get 125 beats per minute. So my underlying rhythm, sinus tach at 125. I do have some ST segment depression, although it's not you know, too notable. And let's look at these PVCs. I have three of them, so I have multiple, but I need to decide, are they unifocal, multifocal, and do they occur in a pattern? So all these PVCs look the same. They all generally look like the same shape, same size. So they're unifocal. And they don't seem to occur in a pattern. I have one over here, and then I go back into a sinus rhythm for a while. Then I have one here, a couple beats, and I have one here. So there's no pattern to it. So it's not bigeminal or trigeminal. So we're just going to call it unifocal PVC. So sinus tachycardia at 125 beats per minute with unifocal PVCs. Um, you could put three unifocal PVCs. Um, that's fine. You're just kind of delving into a little bit more detail. But unifocal PVCs is enough information there. All right, um, for this rhythm, so this is showing a bunch of different leads here. So we're going to look at lead two up here. And let's just look at my underlying rhythm. So when I have a normal beat, <laughs> I have a P wave, I have a QRS complex that's narrow, and a normal T wave. A P wave. QRS is narrow, and a normal T wave. My heart rate up here is given to me at 134, but that's including all these other complexes. Keep that in mind. So 5, 10, 15, it is about 100, a little over 100 beats per minute. So my underlying rhythm is sinus. Actually, I'm going to call it sinus tac because it's a little over 100 beats per minute.
And then I have a run of wide complexes. And there, there's three in a row. So we're going to call those runs of E tech. Now, if I only had two, I would just call that a couplet of PVCs because there's only two, like a pair. But since I have three in a row, we call that a run of E tech. So three or more PVCs, we're going to call it a run of E tech. Now, if we look at this, this is actually occurring in a pattern, and I'll get rid of all my chicken scratch here so we can see it a little bit better. I got beat, beat, run of attack, beat, beat, run of attack, beat, beat, run of attack. So they have a very irritated ventricle for some, whatever reason. Um, so for this patient, it's actually like a trigeminal run of attack, which is extremely rare, and we're going into a lot of detail there. Um, for their treatment, they actually got an amiodarone drip because what happened is actually this is post amiodarone drip. They were actually in full fledged VTAC, um, started the amiodarone infusion. They went into a sinus rhythm and then they started going in after that initial amiodarone infusion. They started having runs of VTAC again. And when you have such frequent runs of VTAC, we worry about that patient slipping back into ventricular tachycardia. So we had to start another maintenance infusion of amiodarone, which was one milligram, one milligram per minute to keep this patient in a sinus rhythm. All right, let's look at this one here. Um, sorry for the big line in the middle. I'm not sure why that's there. So we can see here this, the reason it looks a little weird there, there was a shock delivered. Um, so the monitor, obviously this patient was probably in cardiac arrest. Um, so a shock was delivered there. But let's say this patient had a pulse. Um, so we want to look at what kind of rhythm then. We're going to look at lead two. We can see, obviously, right off the bat, this is a very wide rhythm, a QRS, very wide and bizarre looking. So we're going to call it ventricular. And then I have a rate of 185. So with our ventricular rhythms, the normal intrinsic rate of the ventricles is 20 to 40 beats per minute. So ventricular escape is going to be 20 to 40 beats per minute. There's no ventricular bradycardia because if you have a rate less than 20, you're in arrest. So it's not compatible with life. Um, this can also be called idioventricular rhythm or ventricular escape. Your accelerated ventricular, sometimes called accelerated idioventricular is going to be between 40 and 100. So it's accelerated for the intrinsic rate of the ventricles, which is 20 to 40, but it's not quite tachycardic. So that would be accelerated. And then your VTAC is going to be 100 and above because that's what we define as tachycardia. This rhythm right here is very rare. Usually if you're in accelerated ventricular rhythm, you're either slipping into VTAC or slipping into ventricular escape. Um, so it does not sustain for very long. So I don't see it too often on patients unless they're in PEA um, or have something you know major going on. But this rhythm, we know it's ventricular. It's at 185 beats per minute. So this is going to be ventricular tachycardia. All right, next one. All right, so let's pick out our weird complexes right now. The ones that stick out and just look goofy. So I got one here, it's really small, but I can tell it's not like the others, it's wide in nature. Here's the, I highlighted it there so you can see how wide it is. Obviously my PVC right here, and then I got another PVC right here. And I'm just highlighting the QRS complexes so you can see where I'm kind of getting those. My underlying rhythm, so not looking at these ones circled, I have fib waves. I don't have any defined P waves. A lot of people will sit here and try to pick out P waves. Don't do that. If you don't have defined P waves and they're just little squigglies, it's AFib. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. So, and it's irregular. So we can see that my rhythm is very irregular, which is another telltale sign of AFib. AFib rhythms are irregular and have narrow QRS complexes. So my underlying rhythm here is AFib. It's a controlled AFib because I can tell just by looking at this, it's not over 100 beats per minute. Um, I don't know exactly how fast it is. It looks like I got 5, 10, um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 
Uh, so anywhere from 50 to 90 beats per minute, probably on this rhythm. But we're just going to call it controlled AFib. But look at my PVCs. I have PVCs and they all look different. Oh, there's even one here that I missed. So with this rhythm, I'm going to have multifocal PVCs. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So about here is a six second strip. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I'm going to do controlled AFib. I'm just taking my average how many uh, beats per minute. And I have multifocal PVCs. Now this person has like three or four different kind of PVCs, which is very concerning to me. Um, usually if I see a multifocal PVC, I'll see maybe two different types of PVCs, but the fact that they have three or four irritated spots in their ventricles, I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on this patient because they have a high risk of going into VTAC or refib. One thing I did want to mention when I talked about, you know, don't call it ST elevation. So looking at this, I'm just going to look at this complex here. I have a lot of students that try to label this ST elevation here. This is not ST elevation. This is not a normal ST segment. This is a ventricular beat. What you're seeing is that backwards deflection of energy going through the heart. So we can only see ST elevation in a sinus or a junctional or atrial rhythm. So the rhythm has to be originating from above the ventricles to pick up ST elevation. For example, if I had a patient in VTAC, I'm not going to run a 12 lead on that patient unless they're extremely stable because I know that if they are in a true VTAC, I'm not going to be able to see any ST elevation until I convert that rhythm into a sinus rhythm. Now we will do a 12 lead if the patient is stable enough because sometimes we can see that maybe it's an, a bizarre looking SVT or something else going on on the heart. We, we just want to confirm that it's VTAC. But this is not ST elevation, so you do not need to label on ventricular rhythms ST elevation. All right, obviously we know what this one is because it's written right there. I couldn't really get rid of that. This is torsades to points, and a lot of people confuse torsades with V-fib. All right, I'm gonna move to the next slide. This is a V-fib. So when I flip back and forth between these two rhythms, we can see that they are extremely different. With the V-fib, it's very wide and bizarre, so we'll just go ahead and label that one while we can. I can't even count a rate, it's impossible. This is not sustainable with life. When I go back to torsades, you can see that there are definable complexes here. So there are definable ventricular complexes. This is compatible with life, but not for very long. It does degrade back into uh, VFib very quickly. You can cut a rate on this, um, but I don't require it because usually this is pulseless. But one thing I want to point out why it's called torsades is you get this, oh geez, I don't know what that was. You get this very strange, let me try that again, pattern that is specific only to torsades. So we can see that it's wide, then it goes narrow, wide, narrow, wide. And that only happens with torsades to points, or also called polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Polymorphic meaning I have different looking complexes. It's coming from different spots in the ventricles. So if this is my heart, what's happening with torsades is my pacemaker say is moving back and forth from a different area in the ventricles, and it doesn't have to be these two areas, I'm just using those as an example, but it's moving back and forth across the ventricles as my pacemaker site. So this degrades very quickly into VFib. This is something that we have to treat very quickly if we want to reverse. I have never seen this on a live patient. I have only seen this in a cardiac arrest. That's how rare it is. Um, but with torsades, don't label your VFibs torsades because I have a lot of people that say, well, you know, it's narrow here and then it gets a little wider and then narrow and then, you know, and they'll try to make it torsades and you, you can see how hard you really have to try to make that torsades. With torsades, you are going to have those definable QRS complexes. They're just going to be very wide and then get very narrow, where it almost looks like VFib in the middle.
and then widen out again and get very narrow. And that's just because that pacemaker site, that irritated spots in the ventricles is moving back and forth. All right, here we have a systole. <laughs> What's happening here is the patient's probably getting touched or the wires are getting moved. But I can look down in this lead down here and see a pretty flat line. So we're going to call that a systole. A fine V-fib, I wouldn't call this a fine V-fib because I would have little squigglies throughout. And we can see here that it's pretty straightforward, a systole, and I don't have any bumps like that which tells me this is probably a fluke. It's probably someone moving the cords or moving the patient. Um, because if it was fine to be fit, I would see that throughout. So that would be a systole. All right, looking here, um, this patient is actually coded, I believe. Um, but we're gonna pretend that they, and I can tell them because they're reading it through the paddles. <laughs> so they're reading it through the pads. There's no pulse ox, which is another good indicator. Um, but we're going to pretend this patient does have a pulse. And obviously they are being ventilated because they do have an end title. So they're probably being worked. But we're going to pretend they have a pulse at 56. So they're 56 beats per minute. And now I want to look at this. And is it regular? Irregular. It's very regular. I don't have P waves. And looking at my QRS complex, it's very wide. It's like there to there. So very wide QRS complexes um, happening here. So it's a ventricular in nature. You can tell right off the rip, it's definitely ventricular. So I have a ventricular rhythm at 56 beats per minute. So my normal intrinsic rate of my ventricle, so ventricular escape or idioventricular is going to be 20 to 40. So it doesn't fall into that category. My accelerated idioventricular or accelerated ventricular is going to be between above 40 but below 100. So it does fall in that category. So accelerated ventricular at 56 beats per minute. Do not put ST elevation. This is not ST elevation. It's just part of that wide QRS complex. All right, here we have quite a bit going on. So we're gonna look at lead two. This patient was, I remember, having some chest pain. Um, and so let's just look at each complex one by one. So looking at this first complex, I have a P wave, a narrow QRS. Here's my J points. There's some ST segment depression and my T wave. So that's a sinus beat. Here, I have a wide QRS. So this is going to be a ventricular beat. This is not ST elevation, it's just part of that ventricular beat. Sinus beat, ventricular beat, PVC. And you can see it does come early too, because if I were to march out this pattern, and cut that right in the middle, that's where my beat should be. You can see that this beat is premature, it does come early. Easier to see down here. If I were to cut that in the middle, that's where my beat should be this beat comes early and this is the same rhythm. We're just looking at a different lead. So I have sinus beat, premature ventricular beat, sinus beat, premature ventricular beat, sinus beat, PVC, sinus beat, PVC, sinus beat, PVC. My heart rate is 96 beats per minute. I do need to check a mechanical pulse with this and make sure that these PVCs are conducting a beat because if it's not, this patient would actually be pretty bradycardic. But I have a sinus rhythm, 96 beats per minute, with bigeminal, because it's every second beat, one, two, one, two, one, two, PVCs. Now, since they're having PVCs so often, I would worry about this patient going into VTAC. So this may be a patient I want to start an antiarrhythmic on, like amiodarone. All right, this patient. All right, so under, uh, first of all, let's highlight our weird, obviously that's our weird one right there, right? It's our PVC. So it's a very wide, bizarre looking complex. So it's coming from the ventricles. Let's look at our underlying rhythm. So we can just look at this section, just look at this section. 
Um, I have narrow QRS complexes, so it's coming from above the ventricles. And I have these sawtooth flutter waves. So one, two, three, four, five, six here. One, two, three here. One, two, three, maybe even four there. One there, one, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve there. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is going to be a flutter, but you can see it's very irregular, and I have a variable conduction ratio. It is controlled because it's not over 100 beats per minute. I don't know what exactly the heart rate is on here, so I'm going to leave it out just to save us some time. But I do have a flutter. Make sure you put your heart rate. You might have to get a range on this one. It's going to be anywhere from this fast to, or that slow to this fast. So a flutter, it is controlled. At so many beats per minute with a variable conduction ratio. It's going to have a long vein. And a PVC. So I have that very wide, bizarre looking PVC right there in the middle. So a lot of things going on in this rhythm, a couple different things going on. So we'll have to add all those things together. But with this patient, I would worry about their conduction slowing down. It's pretty, pretty long there. Um, so I might even worry about some bradycardia, but that's probably why these ventricles are firing off because it's saying, Hey, I need to raise my heart rate. All right. This person, this is a 12 lead. So we do have a lead three, or sorry, lead two printout here at the bottom. So that's what we're going to focus on. My heart rate, 38 beats per minute. So very slow. I have a wide complex here, wide complex here, wide complexes. So this is an irregular rate, which sometimes can happen with our ventricular rhythms. Basically, this patient was really trying to die, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, but we do have, these are wide complexes, and you can see them even up here. They're wide complexes, so they are ventricular. So this person was in an idioventricular rhythm at 38 beats per minute, or ventricular escape rhythm at 38 beats per minute. I like this because it's not regular, so it does show you that it doesn't always have to be a completely regular rhythm for it to be idioventricular. Um, the ventricles here are just firing off when they can. And basically this person, you know, to put it bluntly, was dying. Their heart was dying. So we see this a lot in patients who are dying. Um, ironically, this patient came in through triage in a wheelchair complaining of weakness. So can't always judge a book by its cover kind of thing. Um, this person needed a pacemaker implanted because their heart was just not beating enough to be sufficient with life. All right, going to this one. Again, you can't see the blocks here, but we can tell that this is a very wide complex, right? So I know it's ventricular and it's very fast. Um, I remember this patient, so I know that it's 210 beats per minute. And the faster it gets, you know, the more and more narrow it's going to look, but it's still a very wide complex rhythm. So we can see that it has a very wide, bizarre complex, whereas SBT would be very, very narrow. So this is going to be VTAC. All right, this patient was very unstable. So they were in VTAC at 210 beats per minute. Um, their blood pressure dropped to be about 70 over palp, which makes them very unstable. So I decided to cardiovert this patient. So when I turned on my synchronized button on my monitor, which you'll see in your algorithms and you'll see that on the cardiac case scenarios when you watch week seven, I'm syncing because I want to shock this person at a certain moment. Um, what's interesting about this case is that I should be sinking at the R waves. So something was wrong, um, whether it was just the shape of this person's QRS complex. I'm not sure exactly what was going on with this patient, but the monitor was sinking in the wrong spot. So ideally we would want it to sink at the R waves. So when I shocked this patient, we basically had an RNT phenomenon. Um, basically, the monitor is shocked at the end of the QRS complex when the ventricles are trying to repolarize. And that kind of causes a crisscross of electrical energy. So my ventricles are trying to repolarize, but I'm forcing it to depolarize. 
and that threw the patient into this rhythm. Now this is where I'm going to tell you, don't get caught up in real life, whether it's V-fib or torsades, because to me this looks like torsades, right? I got that nice, you know, widening and narrowing of that rhythm and it was caused by an RNT phenomenon. But in real life, it doesn't matter because my patient coded. My patient didn't have a pulse, <laughs> right? So I need to fix that. So I immediately shocked again at 200 joules, um, which for my monitor was the manufacturer recommendation, and we started CPR. What I like about this post-shock is that we don't look at a monitor right after we shock a patient. We immediately go into CPR, and the reason being, if your patient's going to go back into a rhythm, it's not going to be organized at first. It takes a couple seconds for that rhythm to get back in its groove. So you can see right after I shocked this patient, I got a run of VTEC, and then I just got some weird complexes that don't even make sense, and you don't try to make sense out of them. It's just the heart trying to figure, figure its stuff out. I got a P wave, I got a QRS complex here, maybe a P wave there, maybe a QRS, some P waves. So it doesn't make sense, and that's why we just go right into CPR. About 30 seconds this later, 30 seconds later, this patient woke up, told us to stop doing CPR on him, had a normal sinus rhythm, um, started having some uh, PVCs, so we started an amiodarone drip. But luckily this patient had a good outcome. All right, looks like we're gonna be moving into heart blocks now. <coughs> Excuse me. Heart blocks are, I think, the hardest rhythms to look at. Um, it takes a lot of practice to be able to glance at a heart block and be able to tell what type of heart block it is. So I don't want you to feel discouraged if it takes you a while to figure out these heart block rhythms. That's normal. It takes a lot of practice to just be able to glance at it and tell what it is. Usually we have to sit there and kind of look at it and figure it out and examine it. So this is a printout from the hospital I used to work at, so we had a lot of different leads that our printout showed. Normally we would look at lead two, but I want you to come down here and take a look at uh, this V1 down here. Um, we can see just things are way more defined. So I'm gonna look at that just for this purpose. Because it's V1, our P waves are inverted. So this isn't a P wave inversion. You can see up in lead two, my P waves are upright. They're just more defined down here for whatever reason. So it's a little easier to find the P waves. So this is the first thing I'm gonna do Whenever I suspect a heart block, I want to first go through and find my P waves. Oh, there's, see that notch right there? There's one hidden in there. I'm going to assume that there's one hidden right here, and that's why the T wave looks so notched. And sometimes with these heart blocks, you have P waves that are hidden. All right, so I've gone through and found all my P waves. Now we're going to go through and we're going to start canceling out different types of heart blocks, starting at the beginning. Um, first of all, I do have a rate, 41, so it is slow, which is pretty normal for heart blocks. Uh, it doesn't have to be slow, but a lot of times they are. So can it be a first degree? So with a first degree heart block, we have a long PR interval, but we have one P wave for every QRS complex. So I can cancel that one out right away, because right here, you can see that I have two P waves for QRS, QRS complex. Next heart block, can it be a second degree type 1, a winky back? Longer, longer, longer drop than you have a winky box. This cannot. Um, winky box are irregular because you do drop a beat. And we can see that this is regular. So I can already cancel out winky box. Plus I can look at my pure interval and it doesn't get longer, longer drop. It doesn't really have any relationship at all. So I can get rid of winky box. Now let's look at our next one, second degree type 2. If you have more P's than Q's, then you have a Mobitz 2. I do have more P's than Q's. However, with a second degree type 2, and this is what people forget, when you have a QRS that follows a P wave, so you have a P wave and then a QRS, when that QRS follows the P wave, your PR interval will be consistent. And we'll see that on a future example, so you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. My PR interval here is not consistent I have more P's than Q's, but there is no association between those P waves and those QRS complex. So my atria have zero connection with the ventricles, which leads me to third degree. 
A third degree is when my atria are going off its own intrinsic rate. My ventricles are going to be going off its own in intrinsic rate. There's no relationship between the two. And I can see that here. My PR intervals are all over the place, but my RR intervals are regular. So my ventricles are going off on its own regular rate. Switch colors. And if I were to look at all my PPs, it is regular too. So my atria are going off its own rate. So if my atria, my ventricles are both firing off in a rhythm, but they're firing off in their own rhythms. With a third degree heart block, we have some kind of disconnect in our cardiac conduction system. So this will be firing off at its own intrinsic rate, and the ventricles will fire off at its own intrinsic rate, which is typically slower. So this is gonna be a complete heart block, complete heart block or third degree heart block, however you wanna label it, at 41 beats per minute. All right, let's look at the next one. I can tell it's a heart block because my P waves, my pure intervals are way off. So I'm already kind of thinking heart block. So I want to go through and start uh, canceling out different heart blocks. And always start at the beginning. My rate up here should be up here. Where is it? 66 beats per minute, so it's pretty good. So I'm going to start with first degree. First degree heart block, I have one P wave for every QRS complex. I do. I'm going to go through and find my P waves. I do have one P wave for every QRS complex. But with a first degree, your PR interval is going to remain consistent and it's going to be long. I don't have that here. I even have a normal PR interval here. So it cannot be a first degree. So let's look at our second type of heart block. Now we start from the beginning and work your way from first degree to third degree. So my next one's going to be a second degree type one, a winky buck. Longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a winky buck. So let's look at my PR intervals. We're looking to see that PR interval get long. So I do. I have a longer, longer, and then there's probably a dropped beat in here. We just can't see that P wave. It's in the, Q, in the T wave. But if I look at my PR intervals, they, in a pattern, do get longer. Longer, longer, longer drop than you have a winky box. So I can stop right there. I don't have to look at any other of my heart blocks. So this is going to be a second degree heart block. Or you can write AV block. Wow, it's a horrible B. Type 1. Or you can say second degree heart block, winky box. I just can't spell winky box, so I'm going to say type 1. At 66 beats per minute. And that's all I need to write for that one. There's no underlying rhythm here because you're at a second degree heart block. So when we look at the conduction system, there's some kind of block here that's taking this signal going down from the atria to the ventral coals. It's taking longer and longer for some reason until it gets blocked. And usually heart blocks are going to be caused by an idiopathic reason, meaning we don't really know why. They just have some kind of you know, something wrong with their heart's conduction system, or it could be that they have, um, they're having a heart attack, something along those lines, or have heart disease. All right, let's take a look at this one. Um, so, I can tell it's very irregular. That's another thing that kind of makes this one stick out as a second degree type one, is it's irregular. So this will always be irregular. This one is very regular. Um, I have a P wave for every QRS complex. I do have some ST elevation here, and that kind of sticks out to me right away. So looking at my QRS, my J points up here. I'm just going to highlight that um, so you can see that it is ST elevation. This is something I want to put in my name. Uh, my heart rate, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, so it's about 50 beats per minute. So it is bradycardic. And one thing that sticks about this rhythm is my PR interval. So my PR interval is about six to seven blocks long. So that's indicative of first degree heart block. So we can start with the first one and end with it. My PR interval. If the P is far from the Q, um, then you have, or sorry, I can't remember the poem right now. <laughs> um, but if your PR interval is long, you have a first degree. 
So this is with this one, I do need to put an underlying rhythm. We saw that junctional example earlier that was a first degree. So this is why we need to put the underlying rhythm. So this is a sinus Brady at 50 beats per minute. Make sure you note that SC elevation, that's very important. And a first degree heart block. All right, let's look at this one. Um, I have a rate up here, 82 beats per minute. It looks very regular. All right, but I notice how far my peer interval is. So we're looking at seven blocks for my peer interval. So my peer interval is way longer than it should be. So it's gonna be another first degree heart block. It is sinus, my P waves are upright, my Q my Q rests are narrow, I have normal T waves. So this is gonna be a sinus rhythm. It's a normal heart rate, 82 beats per minute. The first degree heart block. And these are definitely your most lesser um, of the evil of heart blocks. So a lot of patients don't even know that they have a first degree heart block or a lot of patients are taking medications like a metoprolol or beta blocker that causes these heart blocks. So a lot of times this might be normal for the patient. It's not something that we correct. All right, this one looking a little different. I definitely have multiple P waves for my QRS complexes. So just to look at all the P waves. So I know it's probably gonna be a heart block. Could it be a first degree? No. My, I have multiple P's per QRS, so it kind of knocks out first degree. First degree is only going to have one P wave per QRS. Could it be a second degree type 1? Do we have a longer, longer, longer drop? I don't see any longer elongating of this PR interval. My PR interval stays consistent, so it's not a second degree type 1. Could it be a second degree type 2? Do I have more P's than Q's? Then you have a Mobitz 2. I do have more P's than QRS's, and when the QRS does follow the P wave, my PR interval maintains the same. So we can see that every PR interval here is the same, meaning there's still some relationship between the atria and the ventricles. So what's happening here is my signal is trying to go down here, and it gets blocked for some reason, but then the second one is making it through. So this is a second degree type two heart block. Now, if I was just looking at this portion of the strip, I have a second degree type two. At however many beats per minute. And just looking at this portion, I have a two to one conduction ratio because I have two P waves for every QRS. If I look at this whole strip in general, we can see down here, I only have one P wave per QRS. So it would be a variable conduction ratio. Once you stop and we decide it's a second degree type two, don't go talking yourself into a third degree. What happens is a lot of people will keep going and say, well, here's my PP and here's my RR. So my RRs are consistent and my PPs are consistent, so I have a third degree. But it's not because there is still a relationship here between the atrium and the ventricle because our PR interval, when that signal gets through, is consistent. So it is not a complete heart block. All right, let's look at this next example. Highlight our P waves. We have one there. Looks like there's one hidden in there. So some of these ones that are hidden, you're not gonna pick up on right away. Um, but when we figure out that's a third degree, you can kind of look back and say, oh yeah, you know what, there's a notch there. There's probably P wave there. So could it be a first degree? No, my PR interval here is way too short for it to be a first degree. Could it be a second degree type one? No, my PR interval does not get longer, longer than drop. You can see it's kind of all over the place. Could it be a second degree type two? I do have more P's than Q's, however, when my Q follows my P, the PR interval is not consistent. So it cannot be a second degree type two. And that leaves us with a third degree for a complete heart block. And it looks like we're going to have a pulse of 38 beats per minute. So it's 
So either third degree or complete heart block at 38 beats per minute. All right, this person was obviously dizzy. <laughs> um, I don't have a rate on this one, but it looks pretty similar to the other ones, so we'll call it 38. Obviously, I can't count blocks there. Could it be a first degree heart block? First of all, let's go and circle our P waves. Right, so could it be a first degree? No, my PR interval actually doesn't look that long. And I have multiple P waves for QRF, so it can't be a first degree. Second degree type one, does it get longer, longer drop? No, it does not. My PR interval remains pretty consistent. Second degree type two, do I have more P's than Q's? Yes, I do. And my PR interval, when a QRS does follow P wave, they all look to be about the same length. So there is some relationship there between the P waves and the QRS. So this is the second degree type two at 38 beats per minute with a three to one conduction ratio because they have three P waves for every QRS. So don't forget that conduction ratio when you have more P's than Q's. All right, this one's gonna be a little difficult to read because this is a 12 lead, so my lead two is down here. So let's first of all, go ahead and uh, take a look at our P waves. Looks like there's one there. So they're kind of all over the place. So already I'm kind of thinking complete heart block because it's just so, so regular. Um, this is why you can't always trust your monitor. This is telling me that it's an idioventricular rhythm and it's definitely a heart block, so we know that that's not true. Um, so my QRSs are here. My RR intervals are regular. It's a pretty regular rhythm. Could it be a first degree? No, we have more P's than Q's. Could it be a second degree type one? No, I don't get longer, longer drop. Um, First of all, my rate is too regular for that, but you can see my period interval is just kind of no pattern to it. Could it be a second degree type 2? I do have more P's than Q's, however, my period interval is kind of all over the place. So it cannot be a second degree type 2 because that period interval would remain consistent. So this is going to leave me with complete heart block, or third degree heart block. And it's at 29 beats per minute, so I imagine this patient is pretty symptomatic. It's pretty low. All right, got another one for you here. And then we just have a very interesting case to look at at the end. So I can already tell it's kind of a heart block because it looks very bizarre. I definitely have more P's and Q's. All right, so could it be a first degree? No, my peer interval actually looks pretty good. It's only five blocks, if even, four blocks, four or five blocks. So it cannot be a first degree, plus I have more P's and Q's. Um, could it be a second degree type one? No, I have more P's and Q's, so it doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't get longer, longer drop. Could it be a second degree type two? Absolutely, I have more P's and Q's, and then my pure interval is very, very consistent. So we can see we don't have any changing in that pure interval. So this is a second degree type two again. At 38 beats per minute. with a two to one conduction ratio because I do have two P waves for every QRS complex. Now, this is where people talk themselves into third degree. So this is why I tell you start with a first degree, end with a third degree, and uh, start eliminating rhythms because you can talk yourself into this being a third degree and it's not. People will look at this RR interval and people will look at this PP interval and say, well, my PPs are regular and my RRs are regular, so my atria is beating at one intrinsic rate and my ventricles are beating at another intrinsic rate. However, what makes it not a complete heart block is that this PR interval remains so consistent. So there is still some relationship between the atria and the ventricles. What's happening is that only every other signal is getting down through the ventricles because there's some kind of block here happening in the conduction system. 
if it was a true third degree heart block, we would have zero relationship between the atria and the ventricles whatsoever. So this peer interval would not be consistent. So that's why I tell people, start with a first degree, start eliminating, and once you get one that fits, you stop. Because a lot of students try to talk themselves into these second degree type twos into third degree heart blocks when they're not. All right, this last one's just kind of fun. Um, it's just a fun rhythm to look at. And a little backstory, this is a patient I had when I was an ER nurse. And um, the patient was complaining of syncope. So they were younger, in their 30s again. Um, and they had, I believe they were at Cedar Point or something and they passed out. So they come in, the fire department does a 12 lead. Um, they think the initial 12 lead was showing maybe a first degree heart block, nothing major though. So we had her on telly. Um, and we're looking, so we're going to look at this in sections. So first we're just going to look at this first section. So we're just looking through here. So when we start off, you can see that my PR interval is long. So probably going to be a first degree heart block. And then we, what do you see happening with the PR interval here? And I'm just looking at lead one. I mean, normally look at lead two, but I'm just looking at lead one because that's where I started writing. But we see that the PR interval, even down here, because they're all the same rhythm, just different leads, starts off long and then it starts getting longer, longer, longer. So this section right here is actually a second degree heart block type one, a winky block. So it gets longer, 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 and then drops. We have a P wave. And then she went into a ventricular standstill, which is not healthy, obviously. So basically only our atria were uh, beating at this time. There's some cardiologists will call this a complete heart block because only your atria is beating. I don't call it that because I think if you have a complete heart block, you're still getting your ventricles beating. Um, but she went into a ventricular standstill, so not good. Notice the time here. Um, it is 17.49, so 5.49 at night. Now we're a minute later, 17.50. So this is the ventricular standstill, where she went into ventricular standstill. And then she comes back. So we'll look at lead two this time, so don't confuse you guys. So I got a P wave, P wave, P wave, QRS complex, P wave, P wave, QRS complex. Now, my PR intervals look pretty consistent. So I got three P waves for one QRS and then two P waves for QRS. So then she actually goes into a second degree type two with a variable conduction ratio. So this girl had a lot of problems. <laughs> Looking at the next section. And let's see, where does it split? Right here. So looking at this first part, I have a P wave, P wave, P wave, and this is just five seconds later. P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. So I have multiple P's per Q's. I have a regular rate. My RR is regular and obviously you can't see anymore. Um, no relationship there. I have different PR intervals for each one. So she goes into a complete heart block. So third degree heart block. Then you can see over here, if I was just looking at this last section, I have multiple P's per Q, but my PR interval starts becoming consistent. So back into a second degree type two. So in one minute, less than one minute actually, um, this patient went, let's see, we have 1749.57. So she went from a second degree type one, which she started in her first degree. So first degree to second degree type one to a ventricular standstill. Three seconds later, goes into a second degree type two with a variable conduction ratio. Two seconds later, goes into complete heart block, and then back into a second degree type two with a consistent conduction ratio of two to one. So obviously I would never throw this strip at a test. I just thought it was very interesting because we watched multiple heart blocks in one patient. And it isn't uncommon for a patient to move between heart blocks. A lot of times I see a second degree type one go into a second degree type two um, and then move back and forth. That's actually pretty common. For testing purposes, obviously, I'm only going to give you one heart block per strip, um, but I just think it's interesting to see real patient, a real patient scenario where they moved through all these heart blocks. Now, this was something that when I looked at it, I had no idea what I was looking at. I had to print off this strip and really examine it to see what was going on with this heart rhythm. Um, 
because it moved so much between these different heart blocks in such a short period of time. So I hope this review was helpful. Um, this is what we would have done in seminar day, but obviously since we're moving online, uh, I'm able to do that. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot me a Canvas message and let me know what strip you're having a question about.